that uh, I'll tell you about later on. You want to see how it works out first? <laughs> That's faith, isn't it? <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. I'm trying to, trying to stop being like Pharaoh. I want to let, you be, let his people go. Uh, so, no, I do have, a, do have a goal for the new year in preaching. I want to give you <coughs> give you what the message is in a timely fashion. <laughs> My goal is 30, 35 minutes. Yep. So, if I start preaching 30, 35 minutes, don't think that I'm not steady. But here's what happens and what I've noticed and what I've realized. We already recorded. Mm. Praise the Lord. Let's let everybody know about it. The head can only take what the hind end can handle. Mm. Right? The head can only catch what the hind end can handle. Right? Yeah. So when you've been sitting in here for 45 minutes to an hour, um, if, if something has caught your attention um, and you're focusing on those things, then you're not catching anything that's being preached anymore. And it don't matter how good it is at 45, 50, 55 minutes, we've lost it. Amen? And so if I can give you bits, if I can give you stuff and, and have you have you desiring more at 30, 35 minutes, you know what I think it'll do? Mm -hmm. I think it'll encourage us to go home and dig in. Mm -hmm. Amen. I think Because I, I don't want you to be so Bible book by the time you leave here and uh, you get home and you're like, I don't want to touch my Bible for the rest of the day. Preacher just loaded our boat and uh, I want you to be able to get home and dive right in where we just left off and get fed yourself. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. So that's my goal. Will it happen oh, every service? Probably not. <laughs> and, uh, but I do want to give you that. Pray for me. Pray for me. And uh, somebody done told me this morning that they got their children already praying again. <laughs> uh, I said, so and so's praying against you. I said, are they really already? They said, yeah. They pray every day. That Pastor Bo preaches long. <laughs> Well, praise the Lord. I wish we'd get the adults on board for that. <laughs> Amen. No, I'm just kidding. But seriously, that is that is something that I have become aware of and something that I do want to make a, a matter of prayer and a point that you can you can help me. And uh, bear, bear uh, you know, I need to confess my faults one to another, right? Y'all want me to help me pray? Yes. <laughs> so he's like, I ain't praying for it. I want you to preach an hour. And I will. Yeah. On occasion. All right. Nahum chapter number three. Nahum chapter number three. Let me turn this thing on. Let's think if I turn that on, Brother Bridge, you turn that on. But he already did. So now the world knows my problems. The world. <laughs> like we got that many to watch. But hey, 500 is a good number. You don't have that many. Nahum chapter 3, look in verse number 11. When you found your place, let's stand together. Oh, can and will. And I will be brief this evening. I know the front end of this service was long. But I guess if I get you get a break in the middle, we'll do some jumping jacks here in just a second. And uh, we'll get the blood flowing a little bit. All right. You ain't got nowhere to go. Midnight's not for several hours. And uh, I'm not going to see it myself. <laughs> I ain't seen that thing in years. And I'm going to try not to see it tonight. Nahum chapter number three, verse number 11. Uh, we'll pick up where we left off. This should be our final message uh, out of the book of Nahum. The Bible says, Thou also shalt be drunken. Thou shalt be hid. Thou also shalt seek strength because of the enemy. All thy strongholds shall be like fig trees with the first ripe figs. If they be shaken, they shall even fall into the mouth of the eater. Behold, thy people in the midst of thee are women. The gates of thy land shall be set wide open unto thine enemies. The fire shall devour thy bars. Draw thee water for the siege. Fortify thy strongholds. Go into clay and tread the mortar. Make strong the brick kennel. There shall the fire devour thee. The sword shall cut thee off. It shall eat thee up like a canker worm. Make thyself many as the canker worm. That's a hard word. Canker worm. Woo! Worm. That's the word. Make thyself many as the... Y'all know when you read in your head, you don't have those problems? Yeah, I thought, hey, yeah, I know all the, yeah, no problem. We're trying to speak it out. It's a little bit, hmm. Make strong thy brick kennel. Where are we at? In verse 16. Thou hast multiplied thy merchants above the stars of heaven. The canker worm spoileth and flieth away. The, thy crown are as the locusts and thy captains as the great grasshoppers. 
which camp in the hedges in the cold day. But when the sun ariseth, they, they flee away. And their place is not known where they are. Thy shepherds slumber, O king of Assyria. Thy nobles shall dwell in the dust. Thy people is scattered upon the mountains, and no man gathereth them. There is no healing of thy bruise. Thy wound is grievous. All that hear the bruit of these shall clap the hands over thee. For upon whom hath thought thy wickedness passed continually. You can be seated this evening. This will be, as I said a, a moment ago, prayerfully our last message here in the book of Nahum. This series uh, has been about seven, eight or so uh, messages that we have covered on these three chapters. And I can say concerning this little book that I've learned more than I ever thought that I would have in this book. And uh, it, it's been a blessing to me to be able to preach it, study it and preach it. And I hope it's been a blessing to you to be able to see as uh, we're coming to the end of this series is how how I wasn't sure how it would really go as we led into it because I've never really heard any messages out of Nahum and I, I've never definitely never heard a series out of it and honestly there's not a whole lot of commentary off the book of Nahum and so I was I was just really relying on my time with the Lord and, and my my prayers and things of that nature but I can say today having completed it, that I'm glad God allowed me to go through it. I'm so glad He allowed me. This prophetic book has taught us much concerning Judah and Assyria, also about concerning the judgment of God and His enemies, on His enemies. Um, so I want to take the time this evening to finish verses 11 through 19 of chapter 3 and ask the Lord to help us in finishing where we started uh, a, a few weeks ago on the final result of sin. This is the final result of sin. The complete chapter 3, we were looking at the final result. We have through this book seen that the Lord show up in sending warnings to Nineveh. He sent warnings that they would be destroyed. Then we began to see how sin would and what cause would cause their demise uh, there in this city. And so this evening, as we look at the final result of sin, we're going to just settle down for, for a brief moment, look over a few thoughts that the Lord's given me uh, out of these uh, few verses. Okay, Brother Mike Brown, how about you pray for us before we preach? Brother Father, thank you. Thank you for this morning service, Lord. We thank you for a house full of believers, Lord. We just thank you. The Father, as the pastor went before God, Lord, we just pray Hey man, with the help of the Lord this evening, as I said, this will finish up our series on the book of Nahum. We have, through this series, seen much about the history of this city, Nineveh. And uh, we, we started looking at it and started looking at the ultimate demise as we'll, we'll finish up here this evening. But the lesson that we have been able to see and prayerfully glean from over the past uh, couple of months, I guess you'd say, is how important it is that we stand for truth. It's important that we stand for truth. The people in Nineveh at one time, if you'll remember back with me, when Jonah was there 150 years earlier, they heeded the warning. And they repented and God spared their city. Well, they stopped standing for truth. And where are we at now? We're here with Nahum telling them, you're about to be destroyed. You're going to, knowing good and well that they were not, God knew that they were not going to repent again and God was going to have to destroy uh, their city. But we have found in our study that in the same area, the descendants of those who would not obey the Lord, we have found here that they were destroyed. The descendants of the people that once obeyed are now being destroyed because they had walked away. That made me think. Brother Mike Brown, we can raise them up and we can teach them everything we know about the Lord. But ultimately, it's on them. Yeah. Right? Ultimately, it's on them to decide whether they're going to serve God or not. Right. Ultimately, it's on them whether they're going to repent and become a child of God. 
I make no claim that bringing your kids to church are going to save them. Church don't save them. The gospel saves them. Amen. Do we give a good healthy dose of the gospel? Yes. I, I try to get to Calvary as quick as I can about any message that I preach. But by no means do I say just getting them to church. There's got to be a life lived outside of these walls. Amen. It can't just be, well, I take my kids to church. Praise the Lord. That's a great thing. It, it is. It is a tremendous thing. I'm so so thankful for every family that we have here. But if what you are here and translated to the house, you know what you are? Hypocrite. You know what your children see? Hypocrisy. You know what your kids don't want nothing to do with? Hypocrisy. No, nothing to do with what mom and dad say they have because they know what mom and dad have is not real. Now, that's not the message this evening, but it was just a little thought that I had when reading that this evening. So I want to finish on this uh, final result of sin. When we think back on what has happened in Nineveh here in this book, something comes to the forefront of my mind that I believe caused the destruction of this city and these people. I believe with everything that's within me, what caused the destruction, Brother Peter Taylor, with this city is found in two things. Rebellion and pride. Rebellion and pride. That caused so many problems. And let's just be honest this evening. Where there is rebellion, there's pride. Amen. Why else would you rebel against God unless you think you knew better? Amen. Well, I'm not going to do that because I don't think that's really what his Bible means. I really don't think that's what that means. Well, if it's plain black and white, why why isn't it? Why do we all try to over spiritualize everything? Yeah. Anybody ever thought about that? How everybody everybody that thinks that the Bible's wrong can't even tell you where John three sixteen is? <laughs> Amen. It, well, that's not what the Bible says. Well, tell me what it says and then show me. Yeah. Well, I don't know where it's at. Of course you don't. But you're a Bible scholar and have no idea as to what the Bible says. You've got to be, you got to be real careful when dealing with folks like that is they don't get the best of us because it, that, that kind of gets under my skin a little bit. Don't it you? <laughs> so y'all pray for me. All right. So Nahum writes here in verse number 11, their pride turned to fear. Their pride turned to fear when they were receiving the, uh, when they were on the receiving end rather of the battle. Look in verse number 11. Thou also shalt be drunken, thou shalt be hid, thou shalt uh, also shalt seek strength because of the enemy. I read behind the commentator that said that this they were going to be drunken was because they were going to have to drink of the wine of God's wrath. Like that's pretty pretty good thought. But I wish the Bible would have said that. Because when you study that word out, it means drunken. If you go back to chapter 1, it's the same word used there when they were drunk. So what were they doing? Out of fear, they were trying to drink themselves, ease their conscience. Here they come. I don't want to die, but if I'm drunk, that's not going to matter, right? So they were doing those things. Fear had caused them to induce themselves into a drunken state and just to settle their fear. They hid themselves for fear that they were going to be attacked and, and, and killed. So they hid themselves from their attackers. They realized that they had no strength against the enemy of God that God had sent to them. Let's say this this evening. I hope we understand this. Satan and his people have no power over the people of God. They do not. Nobody in this world has the power to bring anything against a child of God. Amen. We All power is given from heaven. Right? So why would anybody have any power to overcome something that God has told us to do? Think about that. You say, well, what about all these people? What about all these martyrs? You ever thought that may be God's plan for their life? You say, well, they were killed on their field. Yeah. And we still read books about them because of their faith. And we use those people that we can look at and strengthen our faith by those. You ever think God might have used bad for good? Think about that for a moment. 
You say, well, bad, why do bad things happen to, to Christians when they're serving God? Is it really that bad? Yeah. I mean, how dare you threaten me with heaven? Yeah. <laughs> now, I'm not, I'm, I don't want to go to heaven tonight. Oh, I want to go to heaven. I want all of us to go together. I don't want to leave my family behind, but Brother Peter, if that's what happens, is it really that bad for me? No, not bad for me. Bad for y'all, because y'all going to cry and y'all going to be heartbroken for a long time, Brother Mike. I mean, Brother Mike might not even come to church for weeks because he's going to be in a state of mourning. No <laughs> it's true. It's true. His wife said it's true. It's true. <laughs> but seriously, though, Think about it. They were so much in fear. Satan today still has no power over God's children. The only power he has, Brother Michael Swope, is the power we give him. That's it. That's the only power that this world has over us is what we get. Jesus says in Matthew 28 that all power is given uh, to him in heaven and in earth. Satan and this world have no power. Yet we fear this world is what it's going to do to us. We fear what our government is going to do with us. We fear what our leaders are going to put in place. The only power they have is what the body of Christ has allowed them to have. Amen. This ain't a constitutional message tonight, but we can't get there without thinking about it. Amen. If the forefathers who framed the Constitution were living today and saw the way the church is being attacked and the Bible's being attacked, I don't know about y'all, but I think we'd be loading our muskets. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Now, this isn't a black coat regiment. I'm not calling us into war. I'm not calling us into training. But think about it for a moment. The only reason they got the power they do is because the church dropped the ball. Amen. Judah here in Nahum was willing to stand and fight. They could have waited. They could have waited too late to take action. And they almost did. They'd been, they'd been whooped on for a long, long, long time. I pray that Christians in 2024 will stop waiting. We'll stop waiting for it to get real bad. Well, if they start overreaching, they're already overreaching. Amen. They're already overreaching. We've got to do what we've got to be in prayer. We've got to we we we've got to stand up for what is right in our country. It, it, it's got to have, or else we're going to end up as Nineveh. One time, Nineveh was a country that God loved. They loved God. Right? Not anymore. At one time, the United States of America was a country that loved God. Not anymore. We saw in verse number 11, we saw the fear of Nineveh. Next, I want you to notice the falling of Nineveh. Verse 12 says, All, the strong, all thy strongholds <clears throat> shall be like fig trees. With the first ripe figs, if they be shaken, they shall even fall into the mouth of the eater. Now, when you're reading these prophetic books like this, if you just read them at face value, you're going to be so confused, you're going to have no clue as to what the prophet's talking about. Right? Because they write in such analogies, right? They, they use all different kinds of things. It takes a study. It takes a study. Well, what does that mean? What does that mean? Well, God's giving us a picture Right here. The city began to fall like ripe figs when a tree is shaken. Not just a, a person or two that fell, Brother Mike Brown, but many fell. Has anybody ever shaken a tree, like an apple tree that was, uh, that was ripe? Anybody ever shook something like that that, that was ripe? Um, orange trees, you, you see them down, down in Florida. They'll, they'll put a little thing around them and they'll, they'll shake and you see it'll start by a one or two orange and then it's just like chaos falling. They all fall out of the tree. He's showing us a picture here that these people, as God's army's coming through, these people are going to fall like these ripe figs. He's showing us there that when the fig tree was shaken, the chaos that happens, and that's what was going to happen in the city. The city, he was going to not just drop one or two. The whole lot of them was going to fall. This picture that the Lord's drawing for us is when a child of God stands for him and what is right the aggressors begin to fall away. Yeah. They will. 
They will begin to fall away. When you start standing for what's right and they truly, you know why we have to face so many battles as Christians? Because there's been so many Christians that have backed up on the Bible. They backed up off of what they said they believed. They backed up off of where the, 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 what the Bible says. Well, maybe it doesn't mean that because we have no confidence, men, that we talked about this morning, or confidence in the Lord. We have no confidence in the Scriptures. We have no confidence in our knowledge of them. And so the world just continues to batter you. But as soon as you stand up and they have no rebuttal, they stop. And that's where... We are with Nineveh. They could not come back. Verse 13, we see, verse 13 through 15, I believe it is, we see the fires that speaks of the total destruction. Behold, the people in the midst of thee are women. The gates of thy land shall be set wide open unto thine enemies. The fire shall devour thy bars. When a fire comes, it leaves nothing in its path but destruction. Right. Man, there was a fire not too long ago, close to us, I'm going to say, was it in Robinson? Something of that nature. I can't remember what it was. But there was a, maybe it was a Perry up on the other side of Perry or something. But anyway, I was watching the video of it. Somebody took the time to take a video of it. And they're sitting there fighting the fire, and all of a sudden the whole thing just crashes down. You, you can't even tell there was a hole in there outside of the foundation. Because a fire just leaves in its wake carnage. The gates, he said to Nineveh, your gates will be left open. Your women will be all that's around. And they cannot defend this place. The gates of that land shall be set wide open unto thine enemies. The fire shall devour thy bars. These gates left open, the, the paths would be abandoned. No, nobody could get to you to help you. That's what my God can do to his enemies. And yet we sit back and think they've got the upper hand. Right. What has God done to his enemies here in Nineveh? Church, let me encourage you tonight. That's not Christians we're talking about. That's not God's children we're talking That's not Judah that is facing this. This is Nineveh, God's enemies that are facing this. So let me encourage you tonight as a child of God, stand for what is right. Stand with God. Now, Nahum gets a little out of hand right here in verse 14. I like him for this. All right? I like him for this. Y'all pray for me. But he speaks with such sarcasm here. Notice his sarcasm. He's telling him, he say, hey, draw thee waters for the siege. Fortify thy strongholds. Go into clay and tread the mortar. Make strong the brick kettle. You know what he's telling them here? He says, go in there and fill your pots. Get prepared. Fire's coming. Get prepared. It's going to destroy your city. Fortify your walls. Oh, you already think you're big and tough. You're not that tough. You better put some more on there. God's already telling them, I'm going to kill you. God's already said, I'm going to destroy that city. Nahum's not giving them a warning so that they can battle back against his people. That's not what he's doing. He is, he's kind of like, hey, pour another bucket on there. Pour another bucket on there. Oh, I'm sorry. You prophets of Baal, maybe, maybe you're God's deaf. <laughs> right? Kind of the same mentality. But Nahum here, he's, he's kind of being a little sarcastic with them. He said, add more bricks to that wall. Add more men. Add more weapons. All of it's for naught. Because God still was going to destroy them. No matter what they... Isn't that a sad place to be? Y'all do realize this evening there are places in this country that God has washed His hands of. I don't know where they are. I can assume. But there are some areas of this world that God has washed His hands of. And He's done with them. You get what you wanted. You asked for me to leave, you get it. It's the whole idea of people saying, well, how can God allow school shootings? He ain't there. Right. You told him you didn't want him in there. You told him to get out of our schools. Take the Bible out. Take God out. Well, he's not there. He's, you got what you wanted. Right? It's a sad, sad and scary place. 
to be when the Lord's made up his mind with this city that they're going to fall. And there was nothing they could do about it. Look with me in verse 15. There shall, there shall the fire devour thee. The sword shall cut thee off. It shall eat thee up like the canker worm. Make thyself many as the canker worm. Make thyself many as the locust. This shows again that Nahum is saying this fire is going to consume you. This fire is going to cut you off from the rest of the world. So much as if the locusts came through and devoured the land. There's nothing there. Your city is going to fall into the sands of where they sit. Be covered up for eternity. I don't know what the plan is for North America. I don't know. I don't know if we'll be destroyed. I don't know if the U.S. will be destroyed before Jesus comes back. I don't know that. I can't tell you. I'm expecting him tomorrow morning, by the way. So I'm expecting us to still be here. But we're not all that we used to be, Brother Mike. Nineveh wasn't either. Remember we talked about the city of No, Medes? We talked about that. They were a big time city. They got dropped. Verse 16, we find some humbling words of Nahum to them. Verse 16, Thou hast multiplied thy merchants above the stars of heaven. The canker worm spoileth and flieth away. Thy crown are as the locust, and thy captains as the great grasshoppers, which camp in the hedges in the cold day, but when the sun ariseth, they flee away, and their place is not known where they are. What is he telling them here? is that they build a great name for themselves. You've built a great name for yourself. Your business has done well. Where they sat, the merchants were above the stars of the heaven. They sat right there on the river. They could, they had, they had merchant like um, unbelievable the, the amount of business that they could run out of there. And so they had everything, everything under control. They thought everything was good. And yet we find that their strong military presence still couldn't even stand when God got involved. Church, what are you, Pastor, what are you saying? It's up to the church to get God back in the country. It's up to the church to get God back in Canada. Amen. It's up to the church to get this place straightened out. It's not the people of Judah that were doing this. They were just instruments that God used. That's all we are, church. We're instruments that God can use to get this country, get this world back to where it belongs. Listen, I know in your mind, some of you are sitting there thinking, that's a daunting task. You're already defeated. Amen. We're already defeated, Brother Mike Brown. We think that way. I mean, when we think, man, I've been on this earth for this many years and I don't have many years left, why not use the rest of them we got to, to, to do something for the Lord? Why not spend the rest of them causing a ruckus? Amen. Ha yeah. <laughs> ha. Ain't nothing wrong with it. Praise the Lord. In verse 17, the Bible says, the crowned here, which refers to the princes of Nineveh, the Bible says here that when they are scattered, all the princes and the great men would be hidden as a locust hides in the cold night under the hedges. And when morning light comes, it warms itself and it's scattered. So these brave men, Brother Mike Brown, when the army was coming, they were hiding. But as soon as they went by, they scattered like a covey of quail. They scattered and you couldn't even find them anymore. 
That's what's going to happen to Nineveh in our scripture. These men would hide themselves. We saw in verse number 11 that when they got the opportunity, they would flee to the point that no one would ever know where they are. It reminds me of dealing with those bullies in school. You know that bully that always wanted to bully you, bully, bully? They'd always bully this kid, and all it took was that one kid just pow right in the mouth. They didn't bully nobody anymore. They met their match. They was like, uh. You know why they bullied people? Because they could. They enjoyed the power that it made them feel like they had. Oh, they had the power to be able to bully. They, they bred off the fear that these kids had. You know, it's time that the church stopped being bullied. Amen. Time the church stand up for the truth. Stop being bullied by this world. Stop being bullied to the point. Listen, we have been on the defensive for too long, Brother Mike. We have been on the defensive. We're just, all we're doing is just trying to hold ground. I mean, I can see the church just doing this, just trying to keep the needle from moving anymore. And yet every morning you wake up, the needle's moved. The needle's moved. The needle's moved. We keep getting pushed back. It's time that the, when you're on the offense, you're pushing. You're going. You're offensive now. We need to get on the offensive as a church body. Amen. And, and Hope Bible Baptist Church has to get on the offensive here in Whiting and here in Down East. And maybe that will spread over into Central Maine. Maybe that will spread down into Southern Maine or Northern Massachusetts. Either way. And maybe that will spread down into Massachusetts, New Hampshire, all of New England. Maybe people will get a fire about them. I don't care where it starts. I just want it to start. Amen. Is this a call to the church to get busy? Absolutely. Absolutely. What would have happened to Judah if they continued to just back down, back down, back down from Nineveh? They would have been wiped out if they weren't God's people. Right? What's going to happen to the church in our country if we continue to just defense, defense, defense? Did you ever think, Brother Tom... Harmon, you just had your 70th birthday a couple days ago. Do you ever think in your lifetime, my friend, that you would see them legalize men marrying men? No. Do you ever think in your lifetime we'd see them legalizing marijuana, legalizing drugs, legalizing prostitution, legalizing all these nasty, grotesque things that we're seeing? No, of course not. In just my short, 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 short 45 years on the earth, I never thought I'd see this stuff, Brother Swope. Here we are. What's happened? What, what was it, the 60s that we took the Bible out of church? When Madeline Albright O'Hare or something like that was her name? The old wicked woman? Amen. And it's been a decline ever since. You know why they got the Bible out of school? Because the church didn't even care to have it. You say, oh, pastor, how dare you? How dare I not? How dare, if the church truly cared, the church would have prayed. The church would have stayed in prayer. The church would have done something. The church would have stood up. But it didn't. Now, if you were part of the church at that time, you were saved at that time, I'm not beating up on you. But let's take it back. Let's take it back. Y'all do realize we can get Bible back in school. Y'all do realize that, right? But it's going to take work. You do realize we can get God back in this country. But it's going to take work. Amen. God's people in Nahum finally went on the offensive. And that should encourage you today, guys. Church, it should encourage us today to stop just playing defense. You can never win a war in defense. I heard people say defense wins Super Bowls. Not wars, it don't. They don't win wars. There must be some advancement. Finally, Verse number 19. Finally, my brethren. <laughs> Verse number 19, the Bible says, There is no healing of thy bruise. Thy wound is grievous. All that hear the bruit of thee shall clap their hands over thee. For upon whom hath not thy wickedness passed continually? I want you to see the finality of Nineveh. In verse number 19. There is no healing 
from this attack, the Bible says. This is a wound that would not heal. The city would be leveled and no longer would it exist. Now, I'm going to attempt here, and Brother Michael Swope's going to roll his eyes at me while I do this. I'm going to attempt to give you a medical, um, a, a medical explanation of this verse because this is medical in nature. The wound was in such a way, doctors is what's being talked about here in verse number 19. He's talking about a doctor. Because he said he's speaking there in the middle of the verse, the bruit of thee. And I may be mispronouncing that word. But the bruit of thee. That means that a physician is the one standing over them. The word bruit is a medical term for the audible vascular sound that can only be heard with a stethoscope. Well, who carries stethoscopes? Physicians. It can only be heard by that magnifying device. So the Bible says here in verse number 19, look with me again now that you understand what that bruit is. He said, all that hear the bruit of thee, all those that can hear that vascular, that blood flowing through your veins, all those that can hear that shall do what? Clap their hands over thee. In these days when a physician could no longer help a patient, they stood over top of them and I'm done. I can't do anything. When they clapped, it was over with. The finality of their sin we find here. It was so much to a point, Brother Peter, a doctor couldn't help them anymore. D-E-A-D. -E dead. Wiped off the face of this earth. Completely annihilated. And that's what Nahum here started telling, was trying to get through to Nineveh. They're done. They, they, the finality of this all came because of their wickedness. Now, two questions and we'll wrap it up. With Nahum in mind, what we've just read, what we've just studied, the three chapters that we've been over and dissected for the last few months. What will happen to a country that forgets God? What will happen to a society that is so prideful as to think, Brother Peter, we can make it without God? Destruction. The answer is found here in Nahum. And church, we are part of a battle whether you want to be part of it or not. We are part of a war. We are part of a battle. Listen, I pray we stand. I pray we stand. How are we going to stand? I pray we lift up that blood-stained banner. I pray we stand on the Word of God. We lift high the blood-stained banner and say, God, wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. If it means, if it means that they come after me, God, I'm going to stand for you. Y'all do realize I put this stuff out and I preach a lot about homosexuality. I preach a lot about the sins that are in this Bible. Y'all do realize one day they could come try to censor me. That don't scare me none. Church, keep enough bail money to get me out. Amen. But Brother Mike Brown, our responsibility is hold high. Hold high the standard in which God's given to us. Because what comes to a country that forgets God what comes to a country that walks away and thinks they know more than God? Destruction. Church, keep your head up. Keep your head up. We're on the winning side. We are on the winning side. Amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed.